are listening to Lesbians on Screen, a podcast that looks at lesbian and queer women on big and small screens. This season, we are delving into the global phenomenon of Juliantina. I'm Sheena. My pronouns are she, her. Hi, everyone. Excited to be here. Monica McCowan. My pronouns are she, her as well. And I am a lesbic author and Juliantina superfan and aficionado, I guess, which is why I was invited to be on this podcast. But uh, extremely excited to, to get to relive one of my favorite fandoms that I've ever been a part of. So today we're talking about what I'm going to call Juliantina because I am very English, <laughs> which is a lesbian couple, that's their couple name, and they were featured on a show called Amara Murte, which is a Mexican soap opera, and it's in Spanish, and there are some very nice people online who have gone and done translations, so you can check out all the Juliantina scenes with very nice translations. This show has gained global popularity because of this couple. So the fandom was huge. When was it huge? So the show premiered, I think, in October of 2018, wrapped up in like March of 2019. Uh, Really, really started to hit a fever pitch around the holidays of 2018 rolling into 2019. Because like I'm sure we'll get into that's the the momentum of them as more than friends really started about halfway through the show, which was like 40, 41, because, you you know, like any good lesbian, you know the episodes where they kiss if you're a truly (laughs) avid fan. So that was when things really kicked off. I don't know if that was a spoiler alert. Apologies. I think we we all know that they get together. So so once everybody really realized that it was on and it was happening, it, it just kind of felt like it exploded overnight. Absolutely. And it was huge. It was all of everything. In fact, Monica found it and she was so actively tweeting about it that that's how I found it. I found it because of all the awesome stuff she was putting out. And then I went and trolled the internet, found the the subtitled stuff, was super grateful to the people who did it and couldn't stop watching. I, Sheena, do you know that I have an article where I give people all of the resources and links to find Huli and Tina content? Do you? Yeah. That's amazing. We will totally... Add that in the show notes. Add yeah. To that. I thought that that was one of the reasons besides my fervent enthusiasm that I was asked to be on this because I was actually documenting at the time for other like English speaking fans who was doing the translations. And a big problem was as soon as translations were going up, once the show gained momentum, they were being blocked by YouTube or Televisa for copyright infringement. So unless you were there from the very beginning and you wanted to get into it, and I wanted people to get into it, there was no real way to watch the full record of the scenes if you were trying to do it. So it became like this cobbled together experience of, well, you can get these episodes on this link and then these episodes on this link. But I think it really is what made the the fandom so strong strong and so connected to one another is because it felt like everybody was going on this quest together trying to solve this puzzle and help other people become a part of it and yeah I think that's really what made it even more special than it already was. I understand why people copyright content and I don't think you should pirate content and all of those things right with something like this though there was absolutely no way that I could actually watch the show other than the way I watched the show so I feel like They need to, if they're going to do that, they need to give us an alternative where we can subscribe to English subtitled genuine versions of the content. Right. Absolutely. And I don't think that there's ever a perfect answer for this question. And it is something that I think about a lot. You know, I'm an independently published author, so I'm extremely conscious to the the barriers of entry that I myself have as well as that people have maybe accessing my works so I never want downloading to be the the first place that I go when I'm looking for new content but yeah it's hard it's a very philosophical question uh, when you get into what is a necessary evil if you really want to support this content and you want to see this representation and maybe at the lowest common denominator all your friends are watching it and you want to watch it too I don't know that, you know, there is a right answer and I fully agree with you. And I do know for a fact that those people were putting things up and they were not directly profiting from the content. They had not monetized it in every way. And I really think that given the scope of how the the modern world is changing, that's kind of the new line in the sand. They were not 
profiting at all from those videos. Uh, if you do use a video that's copyrighted by someone else and they let you have it in, I know this because I made Huli and Tina fan videos because that's, again, that was just another arm of the <laughs> obsession. There's like eight of them. But, but, you know, I would use a song and if the song was allowed to stay up, it would be that the singer would then get any money from ads that came from the video. So one got, you know, like a hundred thousand views or something. And I'm not sure what that would translate into for somebody, but I absolutely never got any of that money. Was not allowed to get it. Didn't want it. I just wanted to make a video about Huli and Tina because I had a lot of feelings and, you know, write a 70,000 word fan fiction. Also a lot of feelings, like seriously, now that we're getting back into it, I am so coming to terms with how I was oh man I was so and I don't even know what the right word fanatical I was it was amazing and I completely <laughs> lost the original question that we were talking about because I got so excited talking about them but I think we were talking about pirating things and content and accessibility and very honestly I would have totally paid to see that content if if the original creators had created a thing where it was subbed for me Absolutely. And that was a big argument coming out of it. And, you know, I don't think that they subtitled ahead of time because they didn't expect the reception to be all that big. And then it just took on a life of its own. Um, and I think the the deficit of Televisa, uh, which was the, the Mexican broadcasting channel, and then Univision in the United States is that they didn't move on it quickly enough when they saw that there was some momentum. They still kind of let things lag and when you do that, people become resourceful. And I think that that's exactly what you saw with the Huli and Tina fandom, which is they would have gladly supported that content. You know, they wanted to do right by the show so that it could get another season or a movie or whatever the case may be. Um, but there was there was just not that that opportunity. So yeah, they, they for sure found other outlets. It also became a global phenomenon. I'm in South Africa, so it wasn't just a phenomenon in the States and, and Mexico and that sort of part of the world. It got global. And the thing is, we don't have a way to access American content necessarily other than sort of Netflix. Because yeah. most of your TV stuff won't let us subscribe to any of the online stuff. The big guys, they need to really take a look at what they actually want to achieve with their content globally. Because we no longer live in a world where it's just America. Yeah, and I think that that is an extremely fair perspective. And I certainly know that my lens as an American um, doesn't lend to the best awareness on this subject. Uh, but it's further compounded where I have this issue that if I like something, I assume everybody else loves it too. Because I assume I must have wonderful taste. <laughs> So with regards to the Huli and Tina fandom taking off, I really didn't know because it's so hard with the internet. You know, you know that people are jumping in and talking about, you see other countries popping up and you see people asking in English like, oh, can somebody do subtitles for this language? I can truly have a good frame of reference just because it is really hard to understand uh, if it is as big as you think it is. But for me, it was really when I started seeing videos pop up of the two actors and people like wanting to go find them or wanting to you know they would be in like Sweden and people would spot them and want to take photos and it would be posted um to me that was really when I realized that it was like a worldwide phenomenon at the end of the day I want people to have access to that content I wanted access to that content and to the point about you know, my deficit as an American with understanding what other countries go through in accessibility, this was really one of the first times that I felt it. And I did not like it. I could not understand this extremely popular show because of language barriers, because of accessibility barriers. And I know that I could not have done it without Spanish speaking individuals who translated everything and made it possible. And I will be forever grateful to them. And yeah, it, it was a really humbling moment for me to be in that position and I think that that's when you you do get a much better sense of empathy for other people selfishly when you go through it yourself uh but but yeah I think that for me it's part of what made the experience uh so unique and so interesting and made me really really supportive of the fandom because people really were working together in a way that I had never seen before 
Absolutely. This is a good place to give a shout out to a couple of the internet channels that I've, I managed to find it on was All the Lilies and Zero T. Mm-hmm. Both, yes. both great rep. Nice subtitling. Was anybody else you wanted to give a shout out to in that regard? Yeah. Jewel 10 has a Dropbox link, which is really nice because they are all safely secured outside of a public access network. So they will never be taken down. Uh, And they did a really nice job also uh, going above and beyond and adding the deleted scenes that aired after the fact or aired uh, on episodes in different countries when it kind of made its rounds airing on other Latin American countries. I think those are the big three that I use. So apologies if I forgot anybody. I have like 10 or 15 resources listed in the link that I will share with Sheena so that she can make sure that's added. But the fandom was wild and it was so artistic and spanned so many different kind of mediums. There are people writing fanfic, there are people making like magazine covers, people making really popular fan videos, people translating. So I tried to include all of those in there. It is about, you know, a year old from the time I wrote it. So happy to, if you hear this and have a Julian Tina resource, I would love to add it into that article. I think that would be my plug. But yeah, let's keep that as like a living, breathing little Julian Tina wiki. That would be... Amazing. Love it. it. So why is this rep groundbreaking? Why did it start an internet fire? Yeah. So I think for me, there are two different lenses that I kind of look at this through. And I think that the first is really, this wasn't done on Mexican television. I've written about it a little bit. There was a show that I watched in 2010 called Las Aparicio, which was on a smaller Mexican network that had two best friends that fell in love with one another. So it has been done, um, but they definitely did that with like the the 2010 male titillation flair kind of deal. So I watched it and I, I was really excited to see it, but you know, it wasn't how I personally would have done things. So Julian Tina comes along eight years later as a lesbic writer. It just had all the tropes. Oh my God. Rich girl, poor girl, best friends falling in love, feuding families. There's one, the dads are in each other's bodies, like because they died and switched souls. It's off the wall. And the best part was when people started watching the scenes for Huli and Tina and there's this moment where they find out what the plot of the show is actually about. There's actually an infographic that they're like, before you start watching Huli and Tina, please just read this infographic so that you understand how crazy this whole premise is. But from the construct of Mexican television, this really hadn't been done. And, you know, I've also mentioned this uh, before as well. The the show was airing for four months straight, an hour a night, five nights a week. That's crazy. So they got through in one season what a, a standard U.S. television show that did 20 episodes for an hour each during a season would take them four years to do. So it was, very, you know, it had those hallmarks of an American soap opera, which people aren't as popular with younger generations here, which is like episodes take... 15 to 20 minutes out of a day. So you might spend a week of the show on a single day in their lives. And I think that's kind of how it was. You know, I think toward the end of it, people had been mapping what day they were on. And it was, you know, it took place over like 12 days, maybe. So it, it, over 80 episodes. So it was really, really intense. So I think that just the immersion and the accessibility of going through it every night And also because so many people got pulled in because it had to be translated, it became this group thing. It became very exciting to watch for everybody versus something that centrally for English speakers and other people, if they are bilingual, join in. But, you know, the the Americans are considered a very body and I think pushy group for fair reasons so once we found out we were missing out on something we wanted to be a part of it uh, but the fandom was really really sweet and made me feel very very welcomed uh, and I very much appreciated getting to be a part of it because of them I think you, you know if you have thoughts on the the Mexican aspect and the accessibility of the show I think the, the other big part for me is it was just a really well done love story it was beautiful that's at the end of the day that's it we we don't just want lesbian or queer content we want good lesbian or queer content and it was so beautiful and so nuanced and 
I was in awe of of how well they did with it. Absolutely. I watched an interview. Um, oh, okay. I watched many interviews. I watched every interview I could find. <laughs> okay. But during <laughs> at least one of them, uh, it came to light that the whole story was actually planned from the beginning. This wasn't an incidental, oh, uh, look, there's chemistry, so let's add a romance. They actually planned the whole romance from the beginning, which is why I think it was groundbreaking. The fact that they had a planned lesbian romance in a popular time slot soap opera was phenomenal. Yeah, I fully agree. And I think, you know, again, to the point about filming schedules, so it took four months, so it actually aired uh, for fewer months out of the year than a U.S. television show would, but it was 87 episodes, and those 87 episodes are pretty much shot concurrently. The whole show is done before it ever airs, and yeah, there, there was absolutely an intention and a thought behind it, and this is something that was circulating around uh, for a while that was just such... Also, the, the philosophical ramblings of Juliantina fans are like some for the ages. Just beautifully thoughtful takes on things. It was, it was incredible because the content was so rich and the people watching it were so passionate. The characters and the actors, Barbara Lopez and Macarena Chaga, they didn't know how it would be received when they were shooting it. And I think that's also what's so much more amazing. It's not like they were getting these positive accolades while they were finishing the second half of the season or anything. They did it, putting everything they had into it, not knowing if anybody was even going to watch it. Or if it would be, you know, if it would be completely dismissed or at the very worst, you know, people would come out against it. So I think I think that's so cool. And I think it was really the perfect storm of a beautiful show, a fandom working together and actors who truly put their whole heart and soul into the roles. We were all pretty smitten with with them. Why it was also groundbreaking. So not only did was this planned from the, the beginning when they started writing the show, because I find a lot of shows they'll, oh, shoot, we don't have any queer rep. Let's stick a lesbian in there or have somebody come out as lesbian and, oh, you know, we'll just go from there. So not only was this planned, but they also get their happy ever after. Yeah. No lesbian death. No, like, oh, no, I'm actually, you know, dumping you for the guy who I secretly was in love with. None of that stuff. I know there was a small hurdle, or six, but... <laughs> <laughs> but it's a telenovela, you know? Exactly. And at the end of the day, they got their happy ending. I mean, yeah, they... So most people haven't watched the full show, which I have. So I've watched the majority of it without English subtitles. So just watching the scenes with Spanish and I understand probably about 20% of what I'm hearing, but you can for sure get the gist of it. Not only did they get a happy ending, but they made out far better than any other couple in the show, maybe with the exception of one. Like <laughs> people in other halves of couples, they died, they got incarcerated, one of them, like, somebody did die and the other got incarcerated. You know, it was ugly. That show, given what they did to the other pairs of people, they, yeah, they loved Juliantina as much as we did. But you see, I like that because how often is it the lesbian couple that somebody dies or somebody gets the raw end of the deal? Yeah, I mean, so you, um, you had a mentioned like the hurdle so I don't know how much we can spoiler alert we haven't really touched on what I am and I'm not allowed to say okay so go watch the show listeners go watch the show and then come listen to the podcast because we're going to be going through it an hour at a time and we are going to spoil everything so you may as well just go watch it yeah and it's for viewers it's gonna be about I think 12 hours of content for you of just the Holy and Tina scenes out of an 87 episode. It's about 20 hours, hey? Is it up to that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
I don't know. I haven't watched it. I almost, uh, when you asked me to be on this, I almost went back through and rewatched it and, you know, like did my homework before we got together on this. But I decided I wanted to come at it with fresh eyes. So I read over a couple of things and looked at a couple of pictures, maybe watched like a fan video or two. But yeah, really, really tried to stay out of it so that I could immerse myself in it fully again and feel the love because it's been, you know, it's been about a year. It's time for a, a full rewatch. Thank you for being an awesome listener and supporting Tilt, the channel that brings you all the podcasts you want to hear. You're listening to Tilt. Find more podcasts on thelesbiantalkshow.com. But the the one thing I do want to say about the show, if we're kind of able to do spoilers, you mentioned that they get a happy ending, which is very, very important and something that I, as a, a lesbic writer, absolutely adore and need. Uh, I want things wrapped up neatly, harder for television uh, and not as good for ratings to end on a cliffhanger. But because they do those single season, might not get another one types of deals. One of the whole premises of the show is that death killed their fathers so that they could find one another. Like, that's how central they were to the storyline. The, the two main characters of the show, this whole thing happened to them so that Juliana and Valentina could find one another and find their soulmate. Which is so awesome. And this is why it's groundbreaking. It was planned out. It was a, a very key, important part of the whole structure and storyline the actresses were like pretty much all in on this it was amazingly done the chemistry was great yeah th there were uh scenes that were cut and the two actors really went to bat for the fandom and got you know you don't know what you don't know but it was known that there were a couple I don't know if the scenes that we'll watch will be the edited or unedited ones uh, but the actors were instrumental in getting those scenes released to the general public after it had aired on, on Televisa. I think we should definitely watch the deleted scenes because some of my favorite moments happen in the deleted scenes. Like that end scene with the paparazzi at, outside the studio is one of the most beautiful moments for me. No, it was great. And that scene, um, they included it. So the deleted scenes came out at different times, just so everybody like understands how crazy this fandom was and how quickly things were moving, um, being there in real time. So during the show, you know, there were scenes that were cut differently for the audiences, uh, I think to be a little more like palatable and those would have been like the kissing scenes uh, and the sex scenes and stuff like that. So they came out while the show was still filming. Like after the scene had aired, um, it was Televisa was encouraged to release those uncut scenes. So that's how they came out. But then the scene that you're talking about, which I absolutely love too, that was included in the canon of another country's airing. So that's what's so interesting. It's not canon in the Mexican version. And then a couple months later, the show, you know, because it had, had good enough ratings, it aired in another Spanish speaking country. And I apologize, I don't remember which one and I don't want to misspeak here, but for sure, Spanish speaking country and they just included it for their viewers. It was part of the canon of the show. And then as other countries started you know, doing their own runs of the show. And I think it, it probably it started in Mexico. And then depending on the, the ratings, it, it was picked up by other networks. But yeah, then even more stuff came out really after the show had ended, like a couple months later. And those are some of those deleted scenes that I was mentioning in the Dropbox that they are canon, but they, they never came out when the show was airing. But at the same time, that's really cool. Because all shows have hundreds of hours of footage on the cutting room floor that you never get to see. And nobody buys DVDs anymore. Sorry, DVDs. Um, so it's not like you buy like the extended blooper cut of things. Uh, so you just don't have access to that anymore. So it was really cool that, you know, for a show like this, that we were able to get all of those extra scenes and, you know, completely unexpected. It also answered a couple of questions for me, the deleted scenes, but we'll get to that. 
one of the things I'd like to talk about is also that this is still an important framework. This The story is about both girls coming to terms with their feelings for one another. They're both kind of teenagers, I think, like late teens. They're coming out to their families, to themselves. And the coming out story is a big part of the plot. And I think it's still important that we have coming out stories because, frankly, we still need them. We're still under attack from all over the world for being different, for being wrong. And the more coming out stories we have with positive representation, the less likely baby dykes are going to feel like there's something wrong with them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And I think it's, you know, I was very lucky. I lived in San Francisco in the Bay Area for seven or eight years in my 20s. I realized that I was a young, closeted person who was from a small rural town in Pennsylvania and I had gone away to college and come back and because I'm an idiot (laughs) and made it through without ever really, really coming out. Uh, So I was like 22 and I was like, man, I don't want to be in this town. And I was lucky enough to go to a place with more queer people around in my, you know, in my vicinity. And I just know that that is such a comment on privilege. And it's something that the majority of young queer people aren't really able to do. And I was already in a country where being queer is legal. You know, I don't come from like a devoutly religious home. So I was afraid because I was confronted with this thing that I didn't understand, not because I was afraid that other people were going to reject me. But absolutely, queer representation is so important. And you know, when I was a teenager, I just thought I was like worldly because I liked watching subtitled movies with lesbians. It's not that I was a lesbian. The the lies we tell ourselves. I get so much satisfaction out of telling that story because it's so dumb (laughs) that 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 was real. Um, But I just, yeah, it's so important. And the experience of, of coming out, I think, is this universal idea for queer people. But it also exists in so many permutations and small differences and people really do like to see them reflected in a story as much as possible uh and you know being in the lesbic world like I now understand I'm in my early 30s I like writing stories about people uh that tend to come out in like their mid to early 20s because it kind of like mirrors my experience but I also know that it happens in very different ways for different people. That's the really important thing with representation. Like just because it's not your experience, um, it could profoundly help somebody that's going through that just to see it for the first time. And that's kind of how I felt the first time watching Glee because they were like fairly smart, popular girls, just normal girls in high school that liked each other. And I was like, oh my god, is that a thing? Like, so it was huge for me. And I think that this was for Spanish speaking individuals, and especially LGBTQ people from Mexico. It was huge. Like, you cannot overstate the the impact that it had on a whole generation of, of baby dykes that are coming to terms with things and trying to have representation or even just like a tether for people in their home to be exposed to something, if for nothing else than to like gauge their responsiveness uh, in a way that maybe they never could have before. Absolutely. I feel like, so if Klexa is on the one side of the scale, <laughs> then Julian Tina is on the other side of the scale, if that makes sense. Yeah. It did everything right that Klexa did wrong. Yeah. I mean, I think Cle- this isn't a podcast about Klexa. I really, <laughs> except for how it ended, like I liked Klexa. Two strong women. The ending just killed the entire show for me. I, I, I was just like, oh no, come on. I know. I did. I started watching that show before Klexa ever happened because I love me a good like sci-fi dystopian kind of story. Um, and then I had already liked it. And then I got to Klexa and I was like, Wow. This is amazing. Mm. A show that I already like and this is happening. Yeah. And then it ended the way it did. And I just, it kind of took the wind out of my sails. I think probably similar to how you felt. 
because once you have that and you see it's like you know finding true love and then you see how hollow things are without mm-hmm. it you're just well, I can't do this it's never gonna be like this again so yes decided to to spend my tv watching time elsewhere but I had actually I was very late to Klexa so I this is one of those situations where I missed the boat on how people feel going through it in the moment like the devastation when it happened when you were watching it on live tv I think that that's what I missed out on and why I kind of have a different less emotive response than people who had gotten so invested watching it on prime time I came in I was also coming into that one late and I knew that what happened in the end but I was like okay well let me watch it anyway I decided they just made a stupid mistake because it's one thing killing her but it's a whole different thing how they did it and but you're right. This is not a podcast about Klexa. I just wanted to draw. I just, I just wanted to draw the comparison that if Klexa is on the wrong side, Juliantina was exactly the opposite on the right side. Oh yeah. I mean, they they did pretty right by viewers. Like everything that somebody could want, and they made you work for it. And this might get me in a little bit of trouble with listeners. I think that sometimes when it comes to drama in fictionalized works, whether those are books or films or movies, lesbians are very hard on drama because they tend to be coming from a place of having their own trauma or just wanting to see something happy because they don't have that representation. So we are a tough crowd to please. Like, yes, not killing them off is the bare minimum. But one, we're like, if you give a mouse a cookie, once you give us that, like, we have a list. We have a list of what we want to see. And we're very, because, you know, we've been, we've wanted it for so long. So it, it's just, it's really hard to do something right that the majority of lesbians will get behind. And it was rocky for a couple of episodes when it was happening in real time. Like there were some choices that I'm sure we will discuss that fans were not okay with how it played out. But to looking back on the whole of the show, it was clear that these characters were made with love and respect and not as like peripheral pieces to a bigger story. They really were their own story and I yeah I think it'll be forever looked back on as one of the most respected depictions of WLW. I think you you hit on something there we are a demanding bunch but I think it's because we have so little representation and so whatever tiny little bit of representation we have we want it to be decent representation I think that's the least we deserve frankly yeah when there is queer rep it tends to not be lesbians it tends to be gay males or you know, bisexual woman or whatever. And I have no issue with that. It's just that like up the lesbian rep as well. Right. No, and and I definitely understand that. And I I don't know if you feel this too. You're, you know, I professionally, I write, uh, but for everything else, I'm just a fan uh, when it comes to being a consumer of lesbian media uh, versus I think you have your your hands in far more honey pots right now, uh, getting into books and, and movies and TV and all of that good stuff on the Lesbian Review, which is absolutely amazing. Um, but I, you know, I think it's hard to do anything exactly perfectly, but I also think that there has to be drama. If there's no drama, like, I would love to watch three hours of angsty fluff on things. But I think that the way kind of capitalism is structured, that ratings get you money to keep making the show, uh, and it's all very political behind the scenes. And I I think that these are really big things that, you know, you want to just watch it and enjoy it, but not understanding kind of that at a high level. It sets you up to get your heart broken a little bit, I think, as a viewer, because I don't think it can ever... It can never just be easy for the characters or else the show won't stay on. It's got to be conflict and drama. Absolutely. And that's fine because uh, what Julie and Tina taught us is that you can have all sorts of interesting conflict between the two main characters, still have a happy ever after, and still have a very happy fandom. Yeah. Well, I mean, there were... There were a couple week periods where things were really going off the rails just because of of interactions with male characters. But yeah, and again, that's, you know, it's, it's so hard because I think a lot of us have 
maybe liked a girl that said she liked us back and then went back to her boyfriend or, you know, we felt kind of sidelined from certain things. So that feeling, because the actors did it so well and portrayed it just so beautifully, you know, we were mad on behalf of them and we were upset with a lot of choices that were made. But I think that ultimately I thought, and we'll talk about it when we get to those episodes, um, I thought it made the plot stronger um, because it was really, I'm a big fan of characters going through their own processes of self-discovery. And I'm a really big fan of making bad choices. If you've ever read any of my books, um, you know, I don't do a lot of like the external drama or like the deus ex machina, like accident brings people together. My characters are just literally their own worst enemies. And that's what I think most humans are. You know, it's all the stuff in our head that is making our lives uh, more difficult. And this Julian Tina, to, to bring it back to the reason we're here, um, <laughs> I feel like was a, a really good, intense balance of ex just crazy external drama, like, you know, tra transmigration, which is switching bodies, that's what they call it. Um, and then kids being young and dumb and in love and confused. And the fact that they blended those two completely opposite things together so well and told the story they did. I was just, yeah, so, so impressed. That's a good point. We do need to mention that there are scenes where the girls sleep with boys. Um, but ultimately, they still get together. And it is part of their own internal journeys to discovering who they are and whether or not they're actually in love or sort of some kind of infatuated BFF kind of deal and uh, I actually didn't have a problem with it personally but I guess I was just never one of those women who was dumped for a guy so it didn't you know hit any chords for me. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we end off the podcast? You know I'm running through my Rolodex of things I love about Huli and Tina so just for for viewers um, it sounds like you know you and I are going to be watching this live together and we're just, I'm just going to word vomit my feelings about everything I'm watching. That's correct? That's right. I love that. I love that. <laughs> there's no, there's no such thing as a right answer. It's just me talking about my feelings, which is the role I was born to play. Um, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so I think the, the big thing is before we wrap up this first episode to kind of touch on our, I will share that resource document for you. And then, yeah, anybody that is interested, I think the big thing is, you know, because this is just going to be an audio podcast, uh, want to give everybody access to be able to watch this themselves. Uh, so there are resources to watch it on YouTube, as well as the Dropbox I mentioned, as well as a bunch of other different really fun things that, that users in the Juliantina fandom are doing. So, you know, ideally, make sure you're watching it before you listen to this podcast or watch it with us, or even if you don't listen to this podcast, and hopefully it makes you excited to watch it. Because um, yeah, I'm, I didn't realize until we started talking today, but I'm, I'm so excited to go on this journey again. It's going to be a, a blast. Um, I agree. Go watch it beforehand because you're going to want to re-watch it and then you can re-watch it with us as we're going through it. And you can share your feelings too. You can email us on podcast at thelesbiantalkshow.com. Check the show notes because we've got links to where you can find Monica online. And I'll also include the link to her awesome like web page with all the stuff on it. Thank you for listening to Lesbians on Screen, a podcast that delves into the world of queer women on big and small screens. Join us next week as we continue discussing the global phenomenon that is Julie and Tina. If you love this podcast, then rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts and help other fans find us.